Welcome back to the Harbor. I'm your host, the Kino Cowboy. I'm here with my co-host, Dylan Rodriguez, Harbor alum, big time. Scott couldn't be with us today because he's a big time comedian in New York doing big time comedian stuff, I guess. Also, he doesn't know Kurosawa like I do. Okay. <laughs> well, All right. Oh, I thought it was fitting because that was one of your first big requests on this channel was to do Seven Samurai. Oh, yeah. I think it was. I think that was like yeah. the, I was like begging to do that movie for like probably a year, like or maybe not a year, but like definitely a good amount of time. Yeah, but so that was a good one. But that was early on the channel, so it has like little views. So if you're one of our newer subscribers and you like this episode, you might go back to that one. It's a good episode. I actually rewatched that one. Like I don't know. Whenever you text me like last week about this movie, and I rewatched that episode. It's a good episode. Yeah, you should definitely. Yeah. Go back and check that out. But this movie is just a yeah. whole nother force of nature. <laughs> it's, it is overwhelming. It's one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen photographed. It At the time, it was Jap, uh, Japan's biggest production ever, and it, and it looks like it. Yeah, it's, I have some facts about just some of the production stuff. It's insane what that what Kurosawa did. Yeah, we can get into it in a minute. But whew. of course, only Kurosawa could have pulled that together at the time. And yeah. uh, I also found out that one of the, the associate directors, uh, Shiro Honda, who is the director of the original Godzilla and seven other Showa Godzillas, and um, nice, nice. He stopped directing himself features after terror of mecha godzilla so i i didn't know he was helping out with other stuff like this so that was cool to see it's really cool it's like you know like this came out in the 80s and it just feels so timeless it doesn't feel like a movie that's set you know what i mean it just feels like it's totally. own thing it's so timeless it's crazy and it's yeah Woo. it felt like the art direction was such a good idea and it, it disproves that thing in the 21st century that oh uh to have grit you also have to match that with a bleak art direction and color palette which is not true in the slightest yeah cause... king lear is one of the most tragic stories ever like told like that is like the tragedy you know what i mean yeah. this is like a this is a depressing terrible movie in, in terms of just like what happens to the characters but yeah it's so beautiful to look at it's such a good contrast and it's the way they colored the film and chose the costumes and everything. It just makes you feel almost dreamlike. Like you're actually there. It doesn't feel like if it would have had like a more, um, two thousands kind of dreary, gritty kind of look to it. It would have been more obvious of like, I'm watching a movie. This is a stylized movie, but the, the choice I feel like in this just makes you feel like you're almost flying back in time and witnessing it when you shouldn't be or something like that. My uh, my first note when I was watching it yesterday is maybe the most stripped out movie ever because <laughs> because <laughs> the costumes in this movie I was like holy it's shit insane like, every single one of them I read that he it took like years just for the costumes to be made like it's it's incredible the care and detail that went into it's every beautiful. single specific costume think of how long back then it would have take taken to yeah. make those patterns it's insane that they were able to do that. And but. you said it, it feels like timeless and almost, and I did too, where, you know, it just feels like its own separate thing. But you do get a little bit of that 80s, like, art deco in there because it's so kind of, like, pastel. You know, you get those really nice whites and pastel yeah. blues and reds. So there is a little bit of that 80s in there that I love, but it feels almost dreamlike, like you said. Also, it's such a good and easy thing to do for kurosawa like okay this is a big movie there's a lot of moving parts so we're gonna have this sun be blue this sun be red and this sun be yellow so it's easier to follow what the hell's going on because yeah, it's such it's an epic great art direction great that color theory you know it's basic primary colors and then you get yeah it's really great and it's funny that it's so colorful and it's it's maybe one of the most beautiful shot movies ever ever but Kurosawa himself was like almost legally blind by this point. Wow. He could yeah. barely see. And that is just insane to me. Like the level of just genius I, on an instinctual like level. Like he just knew what everything was supposed to look like. You know, it's just, it's crazy to me to think about. Yeah. And it's such a breath of fresh air for me because the last two movies I saw right before I watched this were Beetlejuice 2 and, um, <laughs> Nostalgia critics kick Assia. So, <laughs> oh my god, 
<laughs> Which I guess I you say, could say uh, some similar imagery in Kickassia. Maybe it's a good double feature. Who knows? Dude, no. definitely. <laughs> definitely. But, um, Anything Doug does is just fucking hell yeah. No, it's just like, I don't know how. Huh? It's been a weird no, week. It is funny you say it whenever, whenever you were talking about like how an adaptation of uh, really just any Shakespeare, uh, mo- more modern movies tend to have those jury or like jury type of palettes, which have you ever seen Macbeth? I think it came out in like 2011. It was with Michael Fassbender. No, I didn't see that one. <clears throat> it's that's like the definition of like, yeah, they made it all edgy and dreary, like Zack Snyder looking. And it just it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work. Whereas opposed to like uh, Macbeth, the, the Coen brothers one or just the Coen brother, they do that stark black and white you know expressionalist like old 20s german style type of yeah thing. And, it, and it really accentuates like the play itself and the writing itself and i think kurosawa does a great job of like because there probably is a lot which not probably there, there is a lot lost in translation because it's you know a japanese interpretation of old english texts so i i can assume there's just so much to be lost there that he makes up for with like the way he presents the film you know he, yeah, he but makes like, up for it with the with the visuals you know but also you get to see how much is similar from the english middle yeah. ages to like the feudal system in japan like it's you know you still have castles they may look different but you still have castles you still yeah. have leaders and hierarchies and all that so it's it's yeah. it's uh yeah. not that hard you know um i think it's not- the sengoku period which is yeah it's pretty much medieval japan well, I was, I don't know how, it's got to be a little past that. When did they invent those kinds of primitive guns that they use in the movie? I'm not sure because, you know, not to get all history, but the Portuguese and the Dutch were going over there like in the 1400s, 1500s, and they had guns at that point. So I, I think it's maybe around that time a little bit. I don't know. I don't know Japanese history. I barely know history <laughs> of the United okay, States. Okay, yeah, it says... The proto guns in China were around a thousand AD, so yeah, it's you know pretty uh, you know gunpowder, big deal. <laughs> yeah, that's it's it's awesome. Yeah, I, I guess we can uh, get into a little bit. I actually, have a few more facts real quick before we get sure, into like, go the for actual it. movie. So they had over fourteen hundred extras in this movie. That is just insane to think about. Whenever, especially when you compare it to just movies nowadays, where you can't be fucked to have 10 people on the screen at the same time. Yeah, you know they I mean? had it. There's only like, what, 12 million budget or something. And I don't know. Yeah. That's a lot for a Japanese movie in the 80s. But like, I don't know. We didn't have another movie, I feel like, on that scale until Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And I mean, Kurosawa built an entire castle just to burn it down. That I mean, that alone is just like, it's insane to me. It, And that's, I mean, it makes the movie, the, the shot where he's walking out of the entrance while it's on fire and both i mean that's the shot that's the shot both both armies are on both sides i'm like setting up like yeah this is cinema this is why (laughs) i'm into what i'm into you know (laughs) yeah no definitely mind-blowing that shot alone just finally seeing it actually you know for years i'd seen memes and 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 just just quotes from the movie and stuff especially the one about the human condition and stuff like that over the years but Mm-hmm. Thankfully, a lot of the imagery was not spoiled for me. And with the context, it was just overwhelming how fucking powerful it was. I think it's which how many Kurosawa movies have you seen? Just like a like a good like few of them, like the big yeah, ones. Yeah, like, like three, three four, including this one. Three. I've seen most of most of his movies, but the thing that makes this one different that I it's a brand new thing for me is I had only seen his black and white films. So this it was like watching a movie in color for the first time. It's insane to me. Yeah. Like I, when I finished it yesterday, I just kept thinking to myself, like it's one of those movies where you can tell that like everything that he had ever done in the movie kind of just it's there and it's like perfected to me. You get like the seven samurai big wide battles. You get like the hidden fortress little moments with the way they kind of, and I, I don't know, I, I could go really deep into like how each, I can see each movie of his before kind of melding its way into uh, the movie itself. You know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's awesome. It, it makes me, it makes it some of the things where you just feel so happy to watch a movie. <laughs> yeah. You know? And it's, um that's one of the few things I knew about the movie beforehand. Cause I remembered listening to Roger Ebert or reading one of the two of him talking about like, 
him starting to argue against the idea that Kurosawa couldn't have made this in his 50s. And then he kind of backtracked and was like, well, you know, it's not. He kind of backtracked on that idea. And and, and I like seeing an amalgamation of a, a director towards the end of his life. And that's why I liked uh, Miyazaki's A Boy in the Heron. It's kind of the same thing, like a lot of his themes and ideas all up on the screen. And it just works so well. And so yeah. I, I, I totally get what you're saying with that. And yeah, I, I know we made movies after Ran, obviously, but it kind of just feels like that's that's the one, you know. Where... Yeah, but like that's the last big epic that he did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 just really awesome. And like from the very first shot, the first minute, you just kind of know exactly what you're in for. It's like he doesn't stray away from like, oh, this is based on a play. We're going to do these nice wides. We're going to have it all in camera. And we're just going to go for it, you know. And there's, I guess it's also just kind of like the style of like a Japanese acting style is already kind of really over the top and, you know, physical, like, like play or uh, theater acting. But there's something about the way that he directs his actors specifically where it's, it's dramatic, it's over the top, but it's like with so much intention that it feels like every small little move, the jolt they make is like, it's precisely where it, it's supposed to be. Does that make yeah. sense? It's so like controlled and it's strange because it feels so chaotic at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. He brings that stage influence with him because with that style, like you said, but also with the kind of stage makeup looking on the, what's his name? The great Lord, the, the Peter Torah. Yeah. Him. And that's got an aspect to it. The choice of color of, and style of like the blood they use is reminiscent oh, yeah. of stage blood. So oh, yeah. it's just all, yeah, very reminiscent of stage. I, well, I love speaking of Hitator and like the way he looks in the stage act, like makeup. You know, he's playing like a seven year old, but the with the actor I think was like in his thirties or forties or something like that. So uh, he was like, like fifty, like just turned 50, fifty. Fifty, okay. Well, I like that they they kind of make it apparent just even from the very beginning that yeah, it's like stage makeup and it's. He looks like a ghost. And then throughout the movie, you kind of see he's like the ghost that's not even haunting the land. He's like being haunted by the land. He's like the thing yeah. that can't he can't leave this place until everyone's dead. You know what I mean? Because all, like I think of all the atrocities that, that he had done to get that land. So it's totally. like he's like this ghost tied to the land. And you really see it, especially whenever, you know, they raid the castle, yeah, and, and he starts walking out. And from that moment on, you're just like, he's, yeah, he's like a ghost. He's a zombie. And it's it's awesome. It's so, so good. So awesome. It's so good. But yeah, speaking of that moment where, you know, he's walking down, the moment that kind of had me, like, do that meme of the person, like, sitting up is uh, that whole montage is amazing. I love that entire montage. It feels like you're a nightmare. That, that haunting music, all the blood, all the gore, all that, blah, blah, blah. But the moment I was like, oh, shit, is it just snap cuts to Taro, the oldest son, getting just killed, like just so fast and so out of nowhere. And the music stops and it's just like, oh, it kind of just like hit me over the head. It was it was one of those moments where I was like, this is the, I'm never going to get to watch this for the first time again. Yeah, because I was almost like expecting his death to be like. A big build up, like ceremonial kind of. And exactly. It's just like, exactly. Boom. No, it's just like that. And it, it just like, oh. And then you get a little bit of Kurosawa's like his comedy that I love, the physical comedy, which the scene right after that, the the um the vassal for uh Jiro, the second son. He's like, Oh man, Taro's dead. <laughs> and then Jiro like looks at the guy with the gun and then he kind of throws the gun off and it's like, Oh yeah, you did that. Yeah, and it just like the, 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 the light comedy right there. It's so great. It's it's. I love the way he kind of puts his little uh, his little comedic moments in there. Yeah, if and, it wasn't like, I could totally see this story having some dark comedy or being played as like almost like a farce in any other kind of I, I way. Think, in the way I that's think it like, is. C- yeah, because it's just like pretty. he's brings about this whole mess, and it's almost humorous at the beginning where it's like. Well, I'm going to pass this down to my first son, and then you two are going to be his, his, you know, brothers, his help if he needs it. Y'all work as three. It'll be a great system. 
I'm ready to step down. And then he steps down and he's like, wait a minute. Why aren't you still treating me like the leader? (laughs) It's like, hey, old man, shut the fuck up. You stupid moron. There's there's stuff like that. And there's also like moments, even at the end when it's like at its most tragic that I kind of found funny. And I think there is a level of intention there where it's like, it's the moment where it's just like five or six minutes of dudes getting shot off horses back to back and it's kind of funny because it just it's one after the other <laughs> like it's like you did this yeah it's obviously very sad but i don't know the way it was filmed it almost feels like they're repeating the same shot <laughs> over and over and over again even though they weren't but you like, know what i mean yeah just like pushing it like in it's, your yeah, face. They, yeah they pushed it to like the very edge of like oh this is this is almost hilarious and i think that was yeah. on purpose i think it was on purpose <laughs> imagine if pride and honor weren't a big thing of Japanese culture, how this movie wouldn't have existed. <laughs> no, no, I swear. But it's just so fu- It was so humorous to me that he gave up his power because of a dream. And then he's like, well, I'm going to give it up, but I want to keep my title and authority. So yeah, I hope, he's I hope like that's a, he's, okay. He's like a brat. And like, and you know, you're not supposed to really like him, but there was a moment, at least for me, where I was like, oh man, I feel really bad for you. Was, I wrote it down. It's like, uh, it's when he breaks down with Tango, which is like the vassal of the youngest son. And yeah. You see on his face, like the change of just like utter guilt and remorse. And he breaks down and it's such a great scene. I love it so much. It comes off almost like a Bible parable in that way of like reaping what you sow. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Especially like. And it's and obviously Kurosawa is. Showcasing the absurdity of the kind of way Japanese feel like they're expected to act with honor. And like, he's yeah, like at the point where he's out with his people, like after he's been kicked out and he's starving, just sitting in this field. And then the guy comes up with some stuff for him and the guy tells him, well, it wouldn't be cool to take this basically yeah he's like yeah like, you're right fuck i guess i won't eat no he's not even that he's like fuck i guess i won't eat also go kill all those villagers yeah because <laughs> now i'm pissed <laughs> off yeah oh shit uh yeah he's so great and then well actually the one who like stole the movie for me though she's not in it much but uh kaide you know like the girl who starts inst- oh, dude Holy shit, that scene where she just like shows Jiro like what the fuck is up is that's like that's just like some top tier like amazing acting, amazing performance, amazing direction, everything. Every part of that was just amazing. And yeah, Kaide, I, I don't know the actress who played her, uh, but she was amazing. I loved her so much. Like very like Lady Macbeth of her, you know. Definitely. And like what a insane concept. Like I I know. You're basically responsible for my husband's death, your, your brother's death, but I hate you. But now I want to sleep with you, and I want to do I'm anything. Use you. She yeah. anything it takes. She's willing to stay in that castle because it used to be her family's. Oh, and then you know, in the end, it's just like she's doing all of it just to, to destroy them. She is like the the thing that's in like, there. Like, yeah, I love the scene of uh, when she's like. I want. I need to be your wife. Go kill your actual wife. And you know she's fake crying and manipulating him. And then you see her just like callously kill the moth and just like scrunch it in her hands and then hide it away. Oh, yeah. Just thought it was a great little visual storytelling. Like it's super obvious, but just it works so well. You know. Totally. And like the the beginning, as soon as. He gives up his power. The son's like, okay, well, you're being weird about it. So sign this document. And he's like, yeah. why would I sign this document? And the his right hand man's like, dude, like it's, it's the same thing, exactly what you said. So what's yeah, the big just, deal? Just fucking sign it. And then there's the what? character that's, I forgot his name, but he's essentially the Japanese version of like a court jester. Yeah, his name is uh, Kiyomi. Yeah, Kiyomi. And I actually have a fact about that actor too. Uh, just like a cool little thing is his the actor's name is what is it Shinosuke Ikehata, but he goes by Peter. Like that's the, that's why you saw the name Peter in the in the credits. He that's like his stage name. Okay, but he he is like one of Japan's most famous like openly gay and androgynous performers. And so 
it's just like really cool. He's very like he plays transgender roles. He's kind of yeah. I, I was kind of Jack... wondering about that. I was like, I yeah. can't get a grasp on this person exactly. Yeah, I don't think you know the Japanese language has it's very binary, like male female type of yeah. pronouns. But I'm pretty sure, like, yeah, they he is like transgender and kind of oh yeah, okay. He's he's been like open since like the 80s or whenever he started performing. So it's really cool. A little little fact about him. Okay, yeah, totally. That makes uh, sense. But yeah, yeah, I do great like casting. And that's yeah, great casting. He he also kind of steals the show every time he's on the on the screen as well. Like really, every performance is amazing. But yeah, he's he's great. I love him. Yeah, I like his character's journey because. He really doesn't have anything else, so he follows this guy around even through this insane. Do you know what it reminds me of? What? Uh, you've seen Seventh Seal, right? Yeah, hell yeah. It reminds me of the uh, what's his yeah. name that's following the night. Totally, it's kind of it's kind of same journey there that I feel like that they go on. Yeah, because by the end they're both like, "What's this even for? Like, what's but going it's like on here?" Towards the second half, when he actually becomes disillusioned, he's. That's when it becomes more interesting, and he's wandering around with him, and he's kind of becoming like a babysitter, pretty much. And oh yeah, definitely. Now suddenly he's the one spouting off intelligent, like <laughs> yeah. What did he say? He's like he can only. It's a mad world, so like the matter saying this world or something like that. I, I love that line that he says. Totally, but I just thought there's all the characters are integral and they're they don't waste time with any extra fluff they all have their own little moments and arcs that are very cohesive and very grand in the scheme of the story but they feel really personal too at the same time yeah like even like the wife sue mm -hmm. her tragedy and stuff like that it's like and then the brother as well he's barely in it but i mean he's like the last shot but he's and, yeah and, and it's like and, even and this it guy really hits you yeah but um, when he gets kicked out and he goes to visit the second son, mm -hmm. and the the um the soldiers they're not allowing the soldiers in, and he like freaks out about it, and he's like, yeah. "Well, guess what? You're just as bad as your older brother." Yeah. <laughs> the second brother is like, "Well, if you'll renounce your power, you know, too bad. I have to serve my brother because that's yeah. exactly what you wish for." So like. <laughs> It's just one of these things like, dude, you brought this all like what's yeah. wrong with you? And it's also like which I guess they do make a point of it at the beginning of the movie where it's like, why is the father treating us this way? All he's ever been like is like, hey, do what you're told. So he doesn't even know his sons. So it's no shit. He doesn't know how they're gonna act, you know. He doesn't know them. But it's like, yeah, the first like 45 minutes of the movie is just like back to back, like, I can't believe you've done this, even though <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> How could exactly you? it's like exactly. that meme that eric andre meme where he shoots him and he's like yeah but <laughs> yeah uh, but um so he like dips out and then the third son the youngest son uh, all Tamburu? Tamburu, yeah that's his name yeah it's uh yeah what is his name Tamburu, i'm pretty sure right no the the third son is um oh yeah samburu 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 yeah that yeah, that's, guy that's it, yeah. I like that he dips out for a while and you're kind of waiting for him to come back and what's his inclusion in the story. And I think he's the most tragic character in the movie. Well, yeah. The fact that he I think he actually handle... loved, he, he loved his father. I think that I think that's what it is, you know. He really loved his father more than any of them. That's he why didn't he didn't want to be insincere with his feelings in the first part of the mm -hmm. movie, and that just led to a complete spiral. I unlike that, which I... I've ever seen. I think that, but I also think maybe he knew that his brothers are shitheads. You know what I mean? I think he might have had an inkling of like, oh but shit, this it comes is not good for anybody. It's just extra complex because you can tell the oldest brother is so resistant at first, and mm -hmm. it's not like he jumped to the opportunity to do it. But then, but is is that a case of he's only doing that because exactly? You know what like, I mean? Like to, to be like, Oh, I'm so humble, but actually I did want this. Cause clearly he did want that. Yeah. Cause of me, like right <laughs> yeah. after it, he's like, yeah, I'm sitting above you, but that's literally what you asked for. So, and then if, the if you want to infer doing? even more, like he was married to Kaede. So who knows what she's been telling him all of it, you know, like, yeah. It's yeah. Great, it's great characters. You know, you can like, you can 
envision what their lives were like before the movie even started, just based off of how they act with one another. It's yeah, like I like writing. family it's dramas like writing. that. I like like it reminds me of like I don't know. It's the same reason why Arrested Development is funny. That it's a family. It's the same as they have all their dynamics, the and it's the same kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's just great. I love. I do agree. I love. That's what makes like Wes Anderson movies work because half of his shit is just family drama. And yeah, that's others... why the royal. Yeah, it's like the royal tenor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly right. Shit. King so, Lear ran but, um, Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah, that's the same movie. Yeah, it's the same movie. You know, I'm sure someone listening to this is like, these guys are so Reddit, dude. <laughs> like, Shut the fuck up. I'm just playing around. You know. Another. But, uh, well, go ahead. What were you going to no, say? No, I was just. I don't know. I, well, the whole thing. I think I I mentioned it a lot on the uh, the Seven Samurai episode. But Kurosawa has this thing with like every one of his movies has like some type of element in it. Like he really like in in Seven Samurai, a lot of it is rain. It's wind too, but it's rain. It's like that's such a key oh, part yeah. of most of that movie. This one is, you know, obviously fire. That's and smoke, but it's the wind. You could hear it constantly blowing, and it's just it's constantly pushing. It feels like a graveyard. It, f- it makes it feel like you're in this desolate graveyard of a place. And the way the wind is used in this movie, one is just crazy. Like, you know, imagine like setting up for a shot. Like you can't predict the wind. Yeah. And those scenes and those scenes when they're on the hills and it's just blowing so crazily. Like I just it's insane that, that they got those shots to begin with. But uh I do think, yeah, it, it plays heavily into the fact that like, yeah, this is a graveyard. This is a desolate barren wasteland full of dead souls killing people that have been killing each other for thousands of years yeah exactly and i think yeah the wind yeah it's 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 really great and there's those shots throughout the film of the sky and the clouds being moved Uh by the wind Mm -hmm. and it comes together at the end where he's it's really like purposely poetic that he gets to a state where he doesn't even know if he's alive or if he's dead right before Mm -hmm. he's reunited with his youngest son and he's being he's aware that he's being tortured in some sort of cosmic way yeah exactly. but it's still like effective and it's like you know yeah for the back half of the movie it's like i want to die i can't i literally he tries to commit seppuku can't do that tries to jump off of, of a ledge lands in sand can't die then also, that scene too. Uh, there's a moment that I just I wrote my notes. It was hilarious. I said the, this motherfucker can haul ass. Cause like <laughs> the scene of him running, he is running so fucking fast. <laughs> I was like, damn, seventy year old man, get it. Uh, no, but yeah, that that moment uh, or throughout the movie, yeah, he's he's trying to kill himself, and he, he when can't. he's tricked, before, like and and his people are killed by both sons' armies. Like you mentioned before, it's so awesome that Kurosawa just lets the music take over with no sound effects. Just lets Mm -hmm. that do the talking. Yeah. And it's one of the coolest looking visual fights, battles I've ever seen. And just the way Mm -hmm. he's at the top and there's so much bloodshed. There's so many fire and arrows coming in. And it's like, how did they shoot this without it being dangerous? dude? Oh, oh, it it must have been because I know on Throne of Blood they were using real arrows and there's a scene in throne of blood where like they're shooting right at this dude and he got like ch- trained professionals to shoot these arrows like inches away from this guy's face so i don't doubt that he got like professional uh archers and had him had them shoot arrows everywhere which is just insane to think about but it's so necessary it's so effective though for it to be believable that he would be in such like a yeah Days after he leaves, like uh, he's pretty much already dead in, in, in a way. He's just lingering on. Um, but it's just like everything's so fi- tactile in this movie. It's incredible. You can find a lot of like Greek tragedy in there too. A lot of a lot of I feel like him, especially unable to die, is very Greek. You know what I mean? Where you have to yeah. suffer. You have to suffer. You have to. Only until you've suffered enough can you like be released from you know the world basically, and uh, yeah, I just find it powerful. 
Oh, that's even I, a line, yeah, similar to a line in the movie about how like we're born, man is born oh, crying, yeah, and then they die crying, and then and it's, then it's like you, in the time by the time you're done crying is your death. So yeah, oh, that's uh, that's uh, kill me, like the fool. yeah, like he, he just starts yeah. spouting off really poignant shit. <laughs> like, yeah, no, he really does. I love, I love a character like that where it's like. It's the fool, it's the idiot, but actually, oh no, like they're like the one, yeah. They're like the he's smallest. like, What the hell am I doing? Why am I still around here? Because it's like he's with Tango and Tango saves the king or whatever, you know, and and takes him to that random house they find, but it turns out it's the the, the son that brother. was blinded and, and banished or whatever. And so uh-huh. like now having to take have letting this guy who did this to you take refuge in your home, like what a fucking horrible pain that and i love the line that he says he's like my sister is able to like be at peace with buddha you know she's able to forgive you but i can't so i can just and i can't give you anything because i don't have anything i can't even see he says something he says something like i offer you uh, a humble gift a gift of the heart i think is what he says and i and it's him playing the flute and i just like it's such a great line and it's like so meaningful I think it's like really like really like the moment that if he wasn't already mad before that, he kind of like snaps. He's just like, oh no, I'm like the worst human being that's ever lived. I I can't do this, you know. And that's when yeah, he falls out the back of the house. And I think that's when he becomes completely like unhinged and like nonverbal. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> he, he just like loses it completely. And then um, while this is happening, it's like Jiro's giving in and having sex with his sister-in-law because yeah. she's like, I'm not going to be an old maid. <laughs> like yeah, I'll I'm keep not. your secret, but I'm staying in this castle. God damn it. God damn it. And, and, um, and of course on top of that, she can't stand for him to touch any other women, even though he's already married. And so she's like, well, you're going to have to kill your wife because I cannot stand for her to know your touch as well. Like a bitch. Dude. Well, well, it's not even that. I don't even think it's that. It's that she's, she doesn't give a shit. She just wants everyone to die. That's why yeah, I, love her. I know, just, but it's just like, just chaos. Like she, I love her. She's like, they frame her as a villain, but I don't think she is. I think she's actually, like, I think she is a spiteful woman who like, who rightly deserves like some type of justice. Cause that whole family destroyed her family. I like, yeah. killed them all. So like it, it's just like the way they frame it. They frame it as like she's a villain, but if you think about it, she's just like on her own little revenge mission. You gotta think about it from like the kill bill aspect of it. <laughs> she's on her little kill bill the bride quest. Totally. But yeah. it's like what's his right hand man who killed his brother? What's his name? I don't uh know. Kagashima. No. Uh <laughs> I forgot, dude. It's, I'm sorry, everyone. It's kind of hard to keep track a little bit but he he's a baller because he's like he's the one who has like any sense he's like the smart he's the one guy who's like okay you should not there's no way i'm going to stand up for you killing your wife because Mm -hmm. of this just throw a gun throw a gun that's who it is and Uh, so he goes to the trouble the best fuck you in the movie before before he eventually kills her is that he places a I love statue of a fox head instead of a real head, and it's like, well, here you go. And he plays, he like he just keeps the bit going that like maybe you know she was. A he wolf. names I can't all the different it. ones. Yeah, yeah I can't believe it stories. this whole time. You know, and he talks about all the lore he's heard about. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like you get like China, and like there's like a I heard that yeah in China there's a there's a fox spirit over there that just like <laughs> made made this guy kill a thousand people. Must that must be her? But but then whenever he gives her the fox, he she, he like looks at her and it's like, oh yeah, you're the you're the fucking fox. You're yeah. the one that's doing all this shit. And speaking of her death though, oh, that's just that's so satisfying oh, and it's oh. so baller. Yeah, it's so beautiful too. I, like, like there's I, some a lot of blood in this movie. A lot of uh, I'd say over the top blood running out, but it's like it's to create such a striking visual image. But this is like they save that, like almost like stereotypical blood splash until yeah. that part. I know that Tarantino just got a raging boner whenever yeah. he saw that scene. Oh yeah, yeah, that specific scene. He was like, "Oh, 
There it is. This is one of those movies I can see of him playing in his home theater in his house, coked up, trying to explain it to some woman who's there <laughs> with him. You just don't get it, man. Anyway, there's this guy in the like. Fuck. He has like three sons, and they're all pieces of shit. You know? Yeah. And then he just like reference another movie, referencing another movie, referencing another movie that's referencing that movie. <laughs> Fucking Tarantino. No, yeah, so, I, I really just, <laughs> I really was just like floored by this movie. It really was such a treat. I'm kind of happy I put it off until now. I don't know. It felt right to watch it. Like, I don't know. It just everything felt right. You know. I'm glad it's not a movie I tried to watch like ten years ago. That's what I mean. I, I think that's what I'm getting at. Is yeah, I'm glad I waited till I was like older in my life to really just fully appreciate it on kind of like every level that it's working at. And I'm sure, you know, I'm missing some things or there's always things you can go back and rewatch movies and, and find. But I think, you know, I'm at a point where I had a pretty good grasp on just filmmaking in general and, and movies and the storytelling that it's oh, really, really, it's really like a rewarding thing to like watch a movie that is just so, it's like working on every level at the highest level. You're just like, you're just like, fuck. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. This is it, man. Cinema. And like, I like that he gives Sue a chance to get out of there, Kuragane, because he, you know, does the whole fox thing. And mm-hmm. she rejoins her brother to flee, and she comes across those ruins that uh, that the, old castle of theirs. Yeah, the Lord. Yeah, whatever his name is, the Lord, Great Lord, <laughs> is what they call him. He happens to be there at this point, and then he's starting to piece together where he is and what he's seeing because. Obviously, the coincidence of them being there is like staggering. It's like he's seeing ghosts of his past. Yeah, and I think I'm kind of putting this together like as we talk about it. I think that there's some there's such a symbolic thing of she dies because she goes back to that desolate place, and the one character that survives is the person that can't see anything. And I think yeah. that's a very symbolic thing of he he's literally can't see all the death and decay and destruction around him. That's why he's alive. And Hinatora is like seeing this as like this is the part where he starts interpreting it as like divine punishment, which is totally oh, fair because oh, it oh, is for sure. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> I, I, if I were in his shoes, I'd be like, "Why the fuck do I see these people that should be dead at a castle that was theirs? It's burned down. Why are they looking at me right now? What's going on here?" Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I would <laughs> lost my all mind. because I had a bad dream. <laughs> yeah, literally, everything was so. And but it's not like. Even just halfway when when the castle is burning down and he's walking out of it, everyone's dead. You compare that to the first like 10 minutes of the movie where they're in the fields peacefully just oh, hanging yeah. out and talking. It's like how, coming that far in just an hour and 20 minutes is insane. Yeah. It's completely believable because of just the dynamics and like the old school Japanese way of thinking. Yeah. It's just another thing about Kurosawa, man. It's his movies are long as shit, but they don't, they just fly by. Like it's crazy how like a movie that's almost three hours can just, just go by like that. Cause yeah, you're you're just like so enthralled with the story. And it's it's mainly talking and it feels so fast paced. And I think that has to do a lot with like I was saying, like the way he he blocks and the way he like chooses his actors to like move. There's such a kinetic energy to the way they move. That just it kind of oh. guides you. It it guides your eyes in such a way that like, yeah, you just can't take your eyes off the screen. Yeah, and then finally, Saburo when he comes back to confront Jiro and get his father figure out where his father is, Jiro's like, well, we also need to find out where yeah. he is because I guess we don't really know, but you know, we have an idea, but like, but um. Saburo gets an idea of where he might be. So he goes looking for him. And his like army is just Jiro completely underestimated him and they get fucked up, which is deserved. But also mm-hmm. like it's just a whole path of destruction. All three brothers were just this big path of destruction. So is their dad. And it's just like you don't really I don't really have sides here. I'm not like rooting for Saburo to take down his brother, even though because he's the one who kind of instigated the beginning but also he wasn't being Jiro was just like here so i don't know Jiro's like the talking about arrested development he's almost like the buster he just is such a fucking pushover you know like yeah he's just 
easily guided type you know what i mean yeah uh yeah and then and then they're Some all killing like each Job. other yeah i was gonna say <laughs> yeah. well I, I guess i don't know I mean, it's just funny to think about just like those dynamics of like yeah what if this movie was like a like a straight up like comedy you know what i mean like well i mean a lot of times you know, because it's based off of King Lear. That's what they play it as a lot, as 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 comedy. They play, yeah, I know, they play yeah. Like they play up like the the farcical nature of everything. So like, I can totally see it being played for a comedy. Like just because like the tragedy is so overt <laughs> that I could totally see, you know, them going that far with it and making it funny. Yeah, because I I know a lot of times actors will play King Lear or Hitatora as like just an, an utter buffoon the entire time and i think i like that like he, he's not played for like a fool he's played as like a really really ignorant and arrogant but like tragic sad person and i love that yeah because like he gets reunited with saburo and he's finally able to get some of his senses back as soon as he's like trying to reconnect with his son his son's shot and falls off the horse. I'm like, Oh yeah. I was kind of like hoping that's what was going to happen thematically. I'm like, surely that's what's going to happen. And sure enough, it did. And I was like, yep. I don't know why I doubted you. You know, <laughs> I do love the way it happens though, where it's just so like, like same with Taro, it just out of nowhere. It's just some random bozo who shoots him. Yeah. Nothing epic. No grand finale nope. for these characters. No. Um, and it's like kind of what they deserve because they're all pieces. Exactly. Of shit. Yeah. It, it that act robs which is it, yeah he deserves it but it robs the father of redemption and closure yeah and catharsis yeah and that's why so much so they out. can't even handle it and that's when he starts to die <clears throat> yeah yeah totally. why is there like victorious against jiro yeah definitely so awesome I love it. and I, I love the way that you find out uh uh is it wait is that the way you find out the way jiro dies is like the head or is that the or is that the scene where the, after they cut off the head of uh, of Kaide and they show it? Well, you know. just kind of like you just see him kind of stuck in there with his guys. He's like, you know, we'll go follow us, you know, into death, basically. Yeah, I just can't remember, like you know, the scene at the very end. I can't remember if that's before or after Kaide gets beheaded. Like, is that her head in the in the? I can't remember who showed. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like the oh, very. It's like the last scene before the last scene. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't remember if they actually show it or not. No, they don't. That's like yeah. the point. I can't. I can't remember if it's if it's supposed to be like inferred as Jiro's head or if it's just Kaede who's gotten you know beheaded. Yeah, I don't know. I need to rewatch it, but yeah, I just yeah, I found it's been so satisfying about watching people murder each other, <laughs> die. Yeah, like, it's it, just it's, like. A big toxic family all going down <laughs> together. It's like, yeah, well, it's awesome. It's kind of fun <laughs> in a it's way. Like, it's, it, I mean, it is fun. It's, it's just like, it's like, well, I say it's fun. It's fun because Kurosawa did it. He just has such a, you know, a vision. I, I can't imagine this being boring as fuck. You know what I mean? I can totally see a version of this movie that is just like the most boring, over, like trite thing, you know? Yeah, like Ridley Scott's Napoleon. Yeah, like that. Or like, I guess since you haven't seen it, but like the 2011 Macbeth, which is just, God, it's so, blah. It's like, it's like, yeah, it's it's how like Shakespeare interpretations can go so wrong, in my opinion. It's probably some surface level shit, but, you know. Kurzawa obviously knows his history. He knows how to blend it with his own cultural history in a way that works so well. Yeah, I don't, someone like me who doesn't know enough about Japanese history and culture as much as a lot of other people maybe can still get so much out of the movie because uh, these yeah. kinds of themes transcend culture mm -hmm. and it's just well I think that's why I, I can't remember if I got into this on the Seven Samurai episode but that's why what makes like Kurosawa so like sent out from uh, from like other type of foreign directors is he was obsessed with like russian literature western stuff in fact a lot of his movies the japanese people didn't like initially because they were so western to like too western for them so there is that kind of overlap of he, he really does a good job of melding 
a lot of like Western stories or themes, but putting it, you know, in a Japanese setting or with Japanese ideals, you know, he, he melds the culture so well that it becomes like its own thing. And I love it. He's so good. Yeah. He's, he's just, he's a reason. There's a reason why he's one of the best directors and he, that's why he's one of my favorite directors. It's just, he has, he had such a grasp on like, just storytelling in general it, it's really astounding to me it kind of just blows my mind I, I really am i'm like sitting in a high right now i love oh, yeah. i love that movie it was how i felt after watching challenges <laughs> incredible <laughs> movie yeah glad we yeah. did it challengers yeah if you haven't seen that folks that's one of the best movies of the year might be the best oh, yeah. movie of the year depending on who you are it's uh it's 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 wavering for me as as best right now but this is uh, one of the best ones we've done this year for the harbor. Obviously, I know you haven't seen all, all the ones we've done this year, but I'll yeah. say it as the one who's been here for every episode. This is one of the best ones. Hell yeah. So if you're listening at home and you uh, haven't seen the movie, which I hope you have if you're watching the episode, but you know, definitely make this one of the ones that we've talked about that to, to watch. Anything else about uh, the movie that you wanted to mention? No, I think that about wraps it up, really. I mean, there's just so much in there. But I would have to spend hours and hours and hours just reading up on different literary things, inspiration, different kind of, I don't know. It's a lot. You know, this is a very is surface level episode of our first time watching. It's not like we've watched this and studied this. This is like just a first time kind of reaction to it. It is one of those movies though that I love. It's like my favorite type of, not just movie but art in general, where it like makes you want to go and research and look for other art inspired by. It. You know, it, it's it's just like I think not to get all like sentimental, but I think that's why like we were put on this earth is to like express like this is like true expression to me. You know what I mean? It, it really like you can just feel the passion and the love and the care, and I love it. Yeah. So I think that's why it was so glowing to me yesterday. I just was like, I was ruminating in my, I was basking, basking in the, uh, in the glow of Kurosawa. Hell yeah. I, it's a movie man's movie. I kneel at his feet, baby. <laughs> yeah. If you don't have Kurosawa lost. in your top four, a letterbox, you're a pussy. Well, I had in the Evangelion in my top four, but I guess that's not allowed now because they said, I saw the so what's the controversy? They I said, didn't... well, end of Evangelion, it um technically it concludes the storyline from the show, so we can't count that as something that could be in the top two fifty. I'm like, well, what? so and I saw a post was like, well, what about El Camino from Breaking Bad, or what about Firewalk what about, with me from Twin Peaks? What Pete? about fucking Return of the Jedi? That's the conclusion. To yeah, like, well, it's it's not concluding a TV show technically. Yeah, uh, I guess that's true. No, but, but it was just like you know what I mean. Like, the, what? What are you talking about? It's still a movie. It's it's a movie. It's a motion picture. Yeah, it was. So really like, what does it matter? And it was like only seemed to be directed towards anime and not anything else. So it was like, what? Do you just have something against? I'm not like, well, we'd have to count all of these other movies. I'm like, okay, but like. There are movies. I don't know. Let's no the, one's going to take on them. No one's trying to put Dragon Ball Z Cooler's Revenge in the top 250. I promise. <laughs> but like, it just came off so gross. Xenophobic? Possibly. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And it's like, you know, I'm not an anime guy. I don't watch movies just because, or TV shows just because they're anime. I just, if I something looks interesting to me and it happens to be anime. That's just the fucking medium. It is like, what? it's not that gonna, complicated. I am an anime guy. So I'm going to call it xenophobic. Fuck them. Yeah. Fuck them. But uh, what it is. people are making a stink and rightfully so. Cause uh, well, I, mean, I saw, I saw Jane uh, Showburn, the, the right. woman who directed uh people's Washington Joker. Glo- yeah. No, no, no. Oh, no, Washington no. T- yeah. I, I get those too. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say no. That's a, I think it's oh, the other one. That's a watch the people go. Yeah, who she's obviously big on Twin Peaks too. So yeah, so she got good taste, and yeah, she. I saw her. That's what I. That's what brought it to my attention. Is like she was like, "What the fuck? What is this?" Yeah, but it's just like okay, what constitutes a movie? I think. Well, I mean, it's a. It came out in theaters. It's over forty minutes. It came out in theaters. Not that a movie has to come out in theaters, but I'm like I'm saying like. When you start dissecting like that, it's like, well, what are we doing here? 
Yeah, it's like, so are we not going to count like Roma as a movie because it didn't come out in theaters and it was Oscar nominated? You know what I mean? Yeah, you can get all into all these semantics of like what is and isn't a movie. Fucking, that's annoying. Yeah, I now that I know like, what the actual thing is, that's what's the difference between a movie based on the TV show and then one that like continues the storyline from a TV show? Like, what about the Mission Impossible movies? That was based off a TV show that continued the TV, like, like, the or like something that, like. You know, like the SpongeBob movie, like, yeah. <laughs> not that I'm saying it's <laughs> top two fifty worthy. I'm just saying it's like that's technically you say it's based on the TV show, but it's you know your enjoyment comes from knowing the characters and and the the stuff from the show. I mean, I mean, at the time, I thought that was like a, the finale uh, that first movie. It was it the finale like, for Steven Hillenburg. Like yeah, I feel like the end of it. Oh yeah, you're right. It was whenever that was his finale. He went into the show after that, and then that's why I didn't like it afterwards. Nickelodeon was like, "Well, no, we want to continue this." He says, "Well, I'm going to step down as creative director after this movie," and that's when it started to change. It got weird. Yeah, I didn't like. I'm actually making a a a video about the uh in a a couple months as like a celebration of the 20th anniversary of the SpongeBob movie. Hell yeah. Yeah, because oh. yeah, once that movie came out, and like the, I, I have a vivid memory of like some of those episodes, I was like, "What the fuck am I watching? This is weird." It, like people it made me uncomfortable. Yeah, people tried to like say, "Oh, you just say that because that's what the the internet said back then." I was not on the internet in two thousand five. <laughs> yeah. yeah, literally, that I was, was actually the first school. time I watched a piece of media, a show that I watched, and, I, and that was the first time as a kid because kids will watch fucking anything and enjoy it. And that was the first time I was like. This doesn't feel like it used to. I don't like this Damn. as much. I'm going to keep yeah. trying. And then I tried for another whole another season and then I gave up. So like, obviously there's something there. If a 10 year old kid is saying this feels different, this isn't as good. Yeah. I just had this like, yeah, I remember, remember it. Like I felt uncomfortable by it. I don't know. There were like some episodes that made me uncomfortable. I was like, because they started going this... to shock humor and like, yeah, maybe it was that. And it was like, it was really it... weird. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, I don't know. There there was like a distinct change that like it weirded me out as I was. Well, this is out. the only show on YouTube where you can get talking <laughs> about Kira Kurosawa and the SpongeBob movie in one episode. So I hope y'all are, you know, subscribed and tuned in for that. Cause... This is premium. Uh... Oh, God. You know what I was about to say? I was about to say this is premium content. Oh, well, we don't say that. I'm literally going to have to fucking bleep that out now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, but, I, uh, I I could have said it. I didn't actually say it, even though I said it. I I could have said it. Yeah. Anyway, we love our content. We love our slop. No. Well, we we try to go beyond slop here. Uh, thanks for <laughs> listening, everybody. If you like the kind of stuff we do, maybe find a movie on our channel that we've talked about. Send it to somebody. Be like, hey, I like their discussion on this. It's kind of cool. Uh, I'm Dylan Rodriguez on Letterboxd. If you want to look at my Letterboxd. Yeah, follow him. Um, I don't really care if you follow me on Instagram or not. Like, I don't, you know, that's more of a personal thing. Yeah, I know I'm Scott wants you to follow him on his Scott K Comedy. I'll, I'll plug him even though he's not here. If you want to support the channel financially, I have a book for sale. You can buy it in the description. It's a coming of age story. We also have a tie-in film to this whole show that I made during COVID when I was bored. You can go watch that. Other than that, I have a new video essay out about Disney park attractions. You can go watch that. I've got two more on the way. So look forward to those because I'm truly trying to put these video essays, trying to boost these up. So look forward to that, guys. We'll see you next week. Next week, I'm doing Bloodsport with Cashers coming back after a hiatus. So look forward to that. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week.